Project Management Insights, providing project managers with professional development in the interpersonal skills areas of leadership, team building and communication. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Project Management Insights. You're going to be pretty excited because today I have another guest um, and today's guest is Mark Steele, the author of Projects on Purpose 2.0. So Mark, welcome to this episode of Project Management Insights. Thank you for having me, Karen. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you're here because I am loving, loving your book. Uh, today, what we're going to do is dive into a particular piece of Mark's book because when we were having a discussion about Mark joining me on the podcast, we both ended up in the space of talking about assumptions and how assumptions can seriously impact a project. And so that's today's topic. We're going to be talking about assumptions. And Mark, I know that in the book, because uh, I've dived into a copy already, you have a specific chapter on assumptions. And I'm already diving into the rest of the book, noticing there's more about it. So talk to me about assumptions, about whether assumptions are good or assumptions are bad. What's your take on assumptions? Okay, thanks, Karen. So uh, assumptions have really interested me for a long time now. When I was first doing my cost engineering certification paper in the early 2000s, I even wrote that paper about the impact of hidden assumptions on projects. And of course, you know, that was mostly bad as, as kind of the description in chapter seven that you probably focused on first, which is called flawed operating assumptions. Uh -huh. That was more of kind of the bad side, the dark side for all the nerds out there. But there's also a positive side of assumptions and how they can be used in a project. And that really is highlighted to me from a maximum that I've summed up from the thinking of Russ Acuff, one of the leading systems thinkers in the country. And that maxim is assumptions, not forecasts, or assumptions rather than forecasts. So there's really this negative side of hidden assumptions and the things they can do to your project. But because of uncertainty, we cannot avoid making assumptions. So there's also this positive side of how we can use assumptions as a critical part of managing the project for better success. So tell me more about that. Okay, well, which side do you want to go with first? Uh, let's go with the positive side, the value okay. in assumptions. Because I think okay. we, all tend, we all tend to think of them as negative. I know I do. And so I'm interested in exploring this flip side of how assumptions can be good and, and why they're good for our project. Sure. And, and I guess the exact quote from Russ Acoff, who, by the way, he, was, uh, he passed away about 10 years ago, and he was a professor emeritus at the Wharton School where he taught for, I think, 40 or 50 years, a really long career. And he was one of the leading developers of systems thinking and its application to, to management of organizations in general. What I've really done in this book is try to apply it more specifically to project management. But one of Russ's quotes is that the future is better dealt with using assumptions rather than forecasts. And of course, I was shortening it kind of this maxim, assumptions, not forecasts. Try to, try to make it more of something to, to do rather than just a nice quote to read. And it really, for me, is also kind of highlighted by, there's a, there's a famous quote from Yogi Berra, right? And he says, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So because of uncertainty in planning, we have to make assumptions. And you know from the project management process that you make assumptions when it comes to cost estimating, you make them when it comes to scheduling, and really every other aspect of the project, all the way from the initial approval stages when you have a business case and you're trying to make assumptions that relate to that business case and whether you should even do the project, all the way through the entire management, development management of the project. We're forced to make assumptions. The problem is, as you've probably experienced before, Karen, many times as the estimate or the budget or the schedule make their way up the chain through management, those assumptions get dropped by the wayside. <laughs> yeah. 
and and you know the higher up management in management you get, the more they really are focused uh, focused on forecasting that number. What's the number? And the implicit assumption there that can hurt the project is that that number is right. Yep. When in reality, it might have you know 150 major caveats attached to it. <laughs> right. And so what I'm hearing then is that the value or the, the good side of having assumptions is that they're all laid out on the table so that there's a clear understanding of how you got to that number. And, and, and I've, I've used this myself where putting assumptions on the table helps because people, it helps people on my team become clearer because they say to me, yes, I agree with the assumption or no, your assumption's wrong because dot, 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 dot. And at least then we gain an understanding of, you know, whether we need additional resourcing, whether we need additional time, whether we need additional funding, whether, you know, something is actually going to work because the assumption has been correct as to what, how it might turn out or what, it, what might happen with a particular area of the project. And so, assumptions in that place are very very valuable and they are a positive thing because they allow clarity to be created and everyone gets on the same page exactly you cannot avoid making assumptions in your project yeah. but unfortunately you can avoid paying attention to the importance of those assumptions right and i think if you understand the importance of assumptions to project success and you downplay the importance of forecasting, it ultimately can lead to a seismic shift in really three main areas of the project. And the first is kind of the whole organizational culture around the budget and the scheduling process and people. Yep. Yep. And the second is it can force you to create a learning and adaptation system, which there's a, there's a chapter on that in, in, in my book as well. Because if your project team is not capable of learning and adapting to changing conditions along the way, then you're in trouble. And one of those changing conditions will be that some of your assumptions will prove to be invalid. Yep. You're incorrect. Yep. And it's best to confirm or deny those assumptions as quickly as possible in the project. Yep. And that kind of leads to the third area, which is kind of rethinking project controls and its purpose. And I view project controls and the purpose of it more as not getting the right number because the number at the beginning is very seldom the number at the end whether it's a schedule or a budget or, or whatever it is. But I view the purpose of that process, which will still look pretty similar. I view the purpose of that project, though, as validating and invalidating those assumptions as quickly as possible. To allow right. everything time to, to learn and adapt and adjust to, to, to what you've learned. Some cases it might be, you know what, we can't develop this new widget for this price, which our marketing people have already determined is the price we need to be able to sell it at in the marketplace. Yep. So we're doing the wrong project. Yes. <laughs> you know, in, in some cases, it won't be that drastic. And it might be that we're not getting, you know, the productivity from our, you know, from our concrete uh, people that we thought we might get. And therefore, that's going to change the duration of the concrete activities on this project. And what can we do about that? And how can we adjust other things to, to accommodate that or to, or to improve it if possible? Right. One of the things I've just picked up on what you said, uh, and for me, this is sometimes a key part of the issue with even setting the project up, as you discussed, uh, at, you know, really setting it up at the start, is that those external people and the sales team is a really, really prime example, have a completely different set of assumptions to the ones that I would normally be working with in my project. And what I find is the, we, we become at cross purposes. It's interesting that your book is titled Projects on Purpose because we, we come to the project with a totally different purpose. Sales has got one focus, for the, the purpose of the project based on their assumptions. And, and we're taking up what we're believing is the purpose of the project with a different set of assumptions. It's not going to work. That's true. And I guess what I would propose is that 
we ought not to have totally different purposes. We, we might have different roles in the project, and those roles determine how we support the project's purpose. But one of the most critical things, in fact, uh, stemming from the title of my book, the most critical thing for successful projects is to ensure that all the team members share the, share the project's overall purpose. So in the, in the case of making a new widget, it's, you know, developing a new product, that might be, hey, we've already set up this business case and we need to be able to develop this product with the, these features for this manufacturing cost and we need to be able to do it with this, within this amount of time to, to please the market. And everybody should share that purpose. Obviously the sales team is going to have a different role in that than the engineering team you know, or the manufacturing team, but everybody should at least share that overall purpose of the project. Sure, but I guess what I'm getting at in this instance is that there might be the shared purpose, but because the assumptions are so very different, so as an example, the sales team might assume that this is something that can be done in six weeks and you know we spend a um, hundred thousand dollars on it because they've really got no idea and yet that's their assumption or maybe it's an expectation and we know that expectations trip up things just as much as assumptions do but the reality of it is you know we have assumptions that mm, it's going to take X amount of hours and that might be six months of development and testing and whatever to 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 get something solid to market so I guess that's what I'm getting at that the purpose might be we might we might think we're heading in the same direction and yet because our assumptions are so very different it might unsettle the whole ability for us to work as a team maybe Sure, but if you create a project culture in which one of the primary focuses of the project team is making explicit all of those assumptions, yep, and then either validating them or invalidating them as quickly as possible, <laughs> yeah, yeah, then then you're gonna you're going to overcome those difficulties, right? Because if, right. if, if this case is built around completely unrealistic assumptions then you should be able to invalidate those assumptions pretty quickly. And then you go back to the drawing board and say, well, okay, what if it cost us twice as much to get there and it took twice as long? Yep. What does that do to our business case? You know, can the salespeople work with that? And you, and you go back to that, you know, that, that part of the, the project process. And, you know, it's really, it's really incumbent that the early assumptions are done <laughs> correctly. Absolutely, and I'm the biggest advocate for having a really uh, properly built out business case, what I call a strong business case, that's going to stand up on its own and show that there is value in doing the project. And listing the assumptions are a big part of that because they're not normally included in a business case from my experience. So, yeah. No, they're not, but they are to be. Yes, totally agree. <laughs> yeah. They should be completely transparent. Yes. Yes. And so if, if you're going to be managing a project, I mean, where are we going to track these assumptions? Because sure, we might have a set of assumptions that are in our business case uh, up front, but how else would we monitor any other assumptions during the life of the project cycle? Sure. Well, you know, Russ, uh, ACOP actually advocated a decision management process right. in the organization to track and report decisions and why they were made. Right. And then that gives you the opportunity then to review them later. Right. Because I think we already have this process in project management, although sometimes it's not used, right? And I, I talk about this in the learning and adaptation chapter. We have this wonderful process called risk management. Yep. And normally, the risks are just whatever we can dream up might happen to our project, right? Like we're building a new factory in California, so we're worried about an earthquake. And that's yes. One of the or there might be a labor shortage, or there might be a material shortage, or something like that. And so it's whatever we can dream up ends up on the risk register, right? Well, what if we expanded that and all, all these assumptions that we're making transparent, we made them part of that process? 
Right. And we kept track of them. Yep. And we determined what are we going to do to validate or invalidate each one of the assumptions? How quickly can we know that this is true or not? And how important is it? Obviously, not all assumptions are created equal. You know, some will impact your project more than others. But a lot of those fundamental early assumptions, especially if they're hidden, can have a massive impact. So, you know, I'm sure you've seen, Karen, there are a number of variations of, of the chart that shows that the earlier in the project you are, the more ability you have to influence the final cost of the project. Mm. You know, so when you're in kind of the thinking parts of the project, you're developing your project team, you're doing your engineering, your design, all those sorts of things, that's when you make the, the greatest uh, impact to the overall cost, the final cost of the project. When you're 80% done and you've already made all those decisions, there's very little that you can do um, to influence the final cost of the project. Although I would argue you can always make it worse. <laughs> sure. But, but there's a very, very little that you can do to make it make it less. Um, and a lot of those early assumptions, you know, in, in the chapter I have on assumptions, I discuss some different categories, management assumptions, technical assumptions, internal assumptions, and external assumptions. Yep. So for example, management assumptions can be really insidious if they're, if they're built into a project. I worked on a litigation of a project that went on for four years. It was worth maybe half a billion dollars in value mm -hmm. and obviously didn't go well, which is why they were in litigation. But one of the parties on the project changed their project manager four times in four years. <laughs> you know, and so they were at a huge disadvantage anytime it came to discussing, well, what did we decide three years ago? Yeah. Yeah. And and what were the reasons for that decision? Because they didn't have those people around anymore. Yep. And yet, this is one of the insidious things about some of these hidden early assumptions. If I went to you, you know, if we, if we move this to kind of the personal scale for a second, yep. by way of analogy, and said, okay, who here in the audience or wherever, anywhere actually, believes that if you eat a diet high in sugar, you won't gain weight and be unhealthy. And pretty much everybody would reject that, right? They would, yeah. they would reject that as an assumption. Yep. And yet, how many people act as though that assumption's true? <laughs> yeah. Right? How many people act as though eating all the sugar they want won't impact their health and won't impact their weight? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... You know, one of the ways you can tell somebody's hidden assumptions is by what people are doing or not doing. And in terms of this assumption around longevity of the project team, if you have a project that's going to go on three or four years and you ask any stakeholder at the beginning of the project, will everybody on the project team here now be here four years from now? They would all say no. That's, that's a completely irrational idea. Yep. We know that you're going to have some sort of turnover. Yet, what are they doing to record all those decisions, the assumptions made, the reasons for the decisions, and, and keep that knowledge in their project team? What process do they have to do all of that? Most projects have nothing. So I would argue that they actually have the hidden assumption that everybody here at the job trailer today, eating donuts and celebrating the start of the project, is going to be here four years from now. Right. You know, and how many times are things like schedules and meeting minutes and correspondence used to cover somebody's backside and not really to discuss what was really decided and why? Yes. So somebody later can understand what needs to be done. Yep. It, it, it's interesting listening to you. For me, I find uh, my issues register is one of those places where I have done exactly what you're talking about because an issue is raised and then it's discussed as something, it's a problem that needs to be fixed and we automatically go into the assumption space. Well, what do we assume is causing the problem? So there's assumptions attached to most of the issues that are raised in a project. 
And sure, but are there assumptions in your project though that you haven't have not yet arisen as issues? Of course. You know, so that I think that I, I think it's great to record assumptions wherever you can, but I think it's it's really critical to have it as a built in part of the project management process. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. You know, from the very beginning. And they might be very small very small things. You know, like I point out technical assumptions as a as a category, and uh, you know whether you're on a software project or a new product development project mm. or a, a construction project, there are many assumptions made by the design team that lead to tremendous project impact yeah. that might never even be discussed with anybody because they're just designing something and this seemed like the way to do it, so they did it that way. Right. And so this is where you're connecting the assumptions to the decision-making process and tracking the reasons for the dis a particular decision being made. And that will either be based on validating, validating the assumptions as valid or invalid. Right. And I, and I view it as kind of an expanded risk management process. Right. Right. Where you're including assumptions as risks. Yes. Okay. Interesting way of handling it, and, and it's so it's so much easier. Well, and it gives you the you know we already know how that tool works. Although yep. <laughs> I think we both seen cases where people had the tool and didn't actually use it. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. Often. Um, <laughs> right right. But we but we generally in the project management community know how that tool works. Yeah. Right? It's a matter of just expanding it a little bit, and it gives us a lot of a lot of interesting abilities, right? We, we can, we, because like I said, not all assumptions are created equal, not all have the same potential impact in the project, but the risk management tools already have the built-in ability to prioritize risks. Absolutely. So, so what are the other two assumption types? Because you've covered two. What are the other two? Sure. So I mentioned internal and I mentioned external. Right. Um, and internal assumptions are obviously anything that, comes from your project team or your organization. Mm -hmm. But there are, there might be a lot of external ones as well. I mean, do you need some sort of regulatory approval in your project? Do you need some sort of permit? There might be marketplace assumptions. There might be commodity-based assumptions. You know, I've seen, I've seen power plant projects. What happens to the price of a power plant if the price of copper worldwide goes up? Yeah, yeah. You know, and so, you know, but that can happen at, at, at you know, I, I use some pretty grandiose projects as examples, but that can happen at, at a very small level as well. Right. You can have those types of external pressures and you're making assumptions about them. And it's, it's important to monitor those assumptions and, and see how likely they are to come true and then validate or invalidate them as soon as possible. Right. And so from your experience in looking at all of these projects and the problems that have arisen and how and and the way that that relates to miss uh what's the right word i'm going to use it's like the assumptions are not either they're not clear or they're misconstrued whatever it is that you want to say so what is your biggest message then around assumptions for projects like using assumptions and 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 being comfortable with assumptions in relation to project success <clears throat> and i'm not sure that right, i've well, word that correctly but you get what i mean yeah sure I, I guess it's really kind of a multi-point thing right first you cannot avoid them you know so don't avoid paying attention to them make them transparent make sure everybody understands what they are make sure they're well communicated and make sure you have a plan and the tools in place to validate or invalidate them and prioritize them. Yeah. And that fits really neatly with the tools we already have available for us for use in risk management. So maybe you don't call it a risk management process. Maybe you call it assumption management or something, but it, it, it's really a very similar set of tool, tool set to what we would use in risk management. And we already have those tools and we understand how they work. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of expanding it to cover these assumptions. Uh, uh, wow. I mean, 
I have spoken often about assumptions in previous episodes. So I'm so glad that we've been able to talk about this at a broader level today, because I think, as you have said earlier on, they're hidden. It's, it's one of those hidden things that we don't really like to dive into. We don't like to think about. I think project managers most of the time believe they have too much to do already and this is just something else. And yet what I've gathered from our discussion today is, and my own sense of it too, is that the more that we focus on these things, the easier the whole process of managing our project would become. Well, exactly. And you almost need somebody in your organization or your project team who's kind of a project Socrates. You know, they're the person who's good at asking those pesky questions (laughs) that you otherwise wouldn't ask or or might avoid. And, you know, that can help you uncover some pretty major hidden assumptions sometimes. Right. Well, that's me. And everybody gets quiet because (laughs) they don't (laughs) like me asking those pesky, nasty questions. So, yeah, that's me. That's me. That's me. I think Socrates referred to himself as the gadfly, right? Right, right, yeah, (laughs) yep, yeah, well, that's good. Well, thank you, thank you so much for joining me on this episode today. I'm sure that the listeners will uh, get a lot out of this, and even if it's just for them to have something uh, to think about in terms of the way that they set up their next project, or what they might add to how they're currently managing their projects to see if adding this assumption piece into the mix will actually create more clarity and make life a lot easier for them. Where can project managers get a copy of your book, Mark? Well, my book's available on the Amazon.com uh-huh. uh, worldwide, and so any of the Amazons. And it's Projects on Purpose 2.0. I call it 2.0, 2.0, I guess technically is correct, more accurate. Yep. And it's available in both in both paperback and Kindle versions. Awesome. And right now it's available at a at a at a fairly decently reduced Kindle price. So if you if you're like if you like to read Kindle books, it's available for a, a more reduced price than it than it would normally be. So great. So now's a good time to go and grab yourself a copy and dive into Mark's book. I am really enjoying reading it uh, and the chapter on assumptions was just great and so I would highly recommend going and grabbing a copy and diving into it for Mark's different perspective on projects. Let me just say that Uh, and what was interesting about me meeting Mark last week when we first connected to talk about doing this episode was how much our thinking about project management aligned and that's what I what I loved about our discussion last week and why I was looking forward to doing this episode with Mark today so thank you once again for joining me Uh, listeners go and grab a copy of Mark's book and please uh, share the episode with anyone that you think might find value in the discussion on assumptions because it is something that's definitely a value to you as a project manager All right. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. And Mark, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me and thanks for doing this great podcast that I know, you know, you is really valuable for all your listeners. So I hope so. And uh, we'll look forward to maybe getting together again for another episode uh, when Mark can talk to us some more about these other different aspects of project management that are not in our standard project management training uh, and that's as you all know the area that I focus on too so I look forward to perhaps the opportunity to do that in the future and uh, happy project managing for this week and I look forward to speaking to you all next week for another episode of project management insights thank you for listening to this project management insights podcast be sure to visit projectmanagementinsight.com and sign up for our monthly newsletter or to receive updates on upcoming training.